we're actually here to talk about the future of public administration, but I really want to know about the rest of the joke. Kathleen Sibelius <laughs> walks into a bar. <laughs> the good news is I walked out of the bar. <laughs> so we are going to talk about the future of public administration, but I want to do that by kind of taking a look at the field through your eyes and your experience. So let's start with that 2011 Forbes naming you the 13th most powerful woman in the world. <laughs> How was it for you as a woman in public service? Well, I first of all, I'm delighted to be here. And lots of friends, colleagues, uh, neighbors, and the O'Leary sisters, a powerful <laughs> duo. Um, Sibelius is my cover name. I'm Kathleen Mary Gilligan. So I'm part of the tribe. And I'm <laughs> glad to be here. Uh, and Reggie, you're happy to be an honorary O'Leary, I'm sure. <laughs> um, you know, I, I never know how to answer that question, frankly, Terry, um, because, you know, when people would ask me, what's it like to run as a woman candidate, or how is it to be in public? I mean, I am a woman, so I don't know what the alternative is. <laughs> um, I would say that one of the things, I'll give you uh, an interesting perspective from Penny Pritzker, who was um, President Obama's Commerce Secretary in the second term, who came out of um, the Pritzker family, uh, is in charge of the Hyatt Hotel uh, group around the world. And Penny is the only one of her family who really was in the hotel business. So she was a woman um, in this broad-based Pritzker business. When she came to government, which she had never uh, participated in actively except as a donor or as a voter, she said one of the secrets about government that came as a total surprise to her was how many women are in powerful positions throughout government. She said, I've never been in rooms before. Uh, you would never find this in the private sector where a table of policymakers is about half and half women and men. She said it's, it's kind of one of the unknown secrets about government, but she found it to be quite dazzling and impressive. So at least her perspective mm -hmm. was government is one of the places, and public administrators are one of the places where uh, women have had a, a very important seat at the table for a long time and run a whole lot of stuff. So there's an incredible number of women running for elected office yeah. um, coming up in the, in the midterm cycle. Um, what other sorts of opportunities do you see in the future for women? Do you think we're going forward and taking advantage of that representation history, or are things regressing? Oh. Um, <laughs> well, it's hard to look at, at some of what happens at the national level and not feel like we're regressing. Um, and, but at the same time, we're progressing. So um, the women elected officials go in waves. Mm -hmm. And we had a big wave of women who were successful as governors in the early 2000s. And at one point built to, uh, I think there were nine women who served as governor. Now that's nowhere near 25 women where we should be um, since half of the country is women. Um, but Nine, nine was an all-time high. And now I think we're back to four or three. But again, a wave is coming. And I think um, we have a, a chance here in Kansas. And, and in Kansas, Laura Kelly would be the third elected woman governor in Kansas, which is quite remarkable around the country because there are lots of states who have never sent a woman to Congress, mm -hmm. never had a woman in statewide office. So Kansas has been one of the environments where women have served in every office in, in the state um, at various times, Republicans and Democrats, and has been very welcoming for women. Um, I think you see you know, women serving, uh, still way too few academic leaders are women, way too few medical leaders are women, way too few women are on boards uh, in um, uh, Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 companies. So yeah, there's progress, but not nearly enough. And if you look around the world, we're still way behind, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. way behind. 
Well, um, there's lo lots of uh, outreach, um, and one of the things we're going to talk about next is how do we motivate people towards careers in public service? You grew up in a family with public service probably around the dinner table based on your father's terms in city council and as a US congressman and then as a governor himself. So what did you learn from growing up in that environment that pulled you toward public service and, and influenced your career choices and sort of a view of the possible? Well, I, did, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and my dad ran for office for the first time when I was five. So I didn't know campaigning was a voluntary activity. <laughs> um, nobody told me. And um, so I thought every family went door to door and put up yard signs. <laughs> Only in later life did I find out some people went to football games and <laughs> had picnics. Um, we didn't do that so much. Um, so I, I, I was very comfortable in that world, which was a pretty male world. Um, and my dad uh, was busy and gone a lot. And I was really, out of the four of us, probably the most interested in a lot of this activity. And so I, you know, I got to sit in on everything. Um, but I also learned that that was a good way to make a difference. I, I, my father was often in a minority position. Uh, he was a Democrat in a pretty Republican city. And um, he was early involved in the civil rights movement. He was an anti-war um, guy in the early days of Vietnam. Um, so he was often on uh, at a cutting edge position, which was not necessarily um, adopted by lots of their friends and family, but I thought pretty inspirational. So I also learned that um, it was important to kind of have a moral compass, know where you were going. Uh, but I think people like him inspired other folks to get involved in government and uh, were a great example of what government can do that's beneficial. He always um, supported education. He was a former teacher. He um, taught me about, um, he created the first environmental protection agency in Ohio. He was governor at the time that the Cuyahoga River, the big river that runs through Cleveland, was declared a fire hazard. And literally, you could be arrested for walking along the edge of the river with a cigarette because it, it caught on fire on a fairly regular basis. There was so much oil and gas and killed all the fish, but it also killed a lot of people. Um, that all changed. So I watched those policies actually be put into place and make a huge difference in people's lives. And it taught me a lot about the good of public, the kinds of things. So you think about an idea, you look at a challenge, you have an organized effort to meet that challenge, and then um, when it's successful, it can be pretty dazzling. So did you decide to pursue an MPA here at KU for the, a particular purpose about going into public service? No. Um, <laughs> sort of. I, um, so I married a Kansan, which is how I got to Kansas. And I started my career both first in Washington, where I'd gone to college, and I stayed in Washington to work for a few years. I, I worked in criminal justice. I worked in prison reform in, uh, a long time ago. Um, and when I came to Kansas, uh, because I married a Kansan who had gone to Georgetown Law School, so he, he was the, the Kansas guy, um, I went to work for the Department of Corrections. And I ended up in a situation where there was a program that KU offered for those of us who were in state government, where the public administration masters was taught in Topeka and it was really geared to those of us in state government. Um, they had three branches. The, the people who were interested in city manager were here on the campus in Lawrence, and those who were looking at hospital administrators were in um, more associated with the KU Med campus. So there were really three kind of branches of the public administration degree. But for those of us who were in, um, state government, 
the, the courses were taught in Topeka and they were taught um, at 5.30 or 6 o'clock at night in, to 9 o'clock at night. So you could actually work full time and go to school. And part of, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do exactly in the future, but I, I knew I wanted to go back to school and it was a way to do that and not have to stop working and just concentrate on school. Um, so it was, it was terrific and it was a terrific, program for me. So the executive ed model of MPA program. It was, and the, um, you know, the, the first, uh, I didn't know at that point how helpful the organizational theory would be. I didn't know what exactly I was going to do. I, in fact, left the job I had at the Department of Corrections at the point I was offered by my boss, who was the Secretary of Corrections, to be the head of the women's prison in Lansing. Uh, I knew I didn't want to be the head of the women's prison in Lansing, <laughs> let me say that. I didn't know what else I wanted to do, but that I did not think was in my um, wheelhouse. But what, um, what the MPA degree did, among other things, was give me this incredible network of people who came to school and, and were in agencies all across government. And um, ultimately, when I, when I then went looking for people to hire, both when I was insurance commissioner and then again as governor, I went back to some of those mm -hmm. individuals who I'd actually gone through the master's program with. Or when I had a question that needed to be answered, I knew people in the labor department. I knew people who were in the AG department. I knew and that network was invaluable. It was unbelievable. So mm -hmm. both the curriculum was terrific for what I ended up doing on Into the Future, but also the people were amazing. Let's pause on the MPA question for a minute as we think about the future of public administration. You mentioned that the organizational theory classes and uh, those sorts of management classes were important as well as the network. If you were designing an MPA curriculum today for future public administrators, would you do anything different? What would, what would be the core skills and competencies you'd want to put in that? Well, I think the, the world has changed dramatically. And um, you, you talked earlier about um, what do you do to inspire people to go into public service. And I am one who is just alarmed every day. I, I represented a district in Topeka that had probably more public employees than any district because I was right in the capital and near downtown. I watched this in Washington every day um, where elected officials spend time day in and day out demeaning public service. And I think that's a very, that's not new, but the noise around that volume has increased dramatically. And I think that's a very dangerous place to be because the last thing we wanna do is discourage bright, talented um, individuals from looking at public service as one of their opportunities. We want the best talent. And by continuing to say these folks are worthless and doing, you know, are lazy and don't know enough, I have found just the opposite to be true. Um, they're dazzling and um, usually way overworked and underpaid, but they are for a mission. The most mission-driven people I've ever seen in my life are often uh, public servants. So I, I find that to be very important. Designing curriculum for the future, um, I mean, technology has to be a huge part of any government operation. And too often, we are way behind mm -hmm. uh, in government instead of way ahead. Customer service, which is um, something that I think most government officials don't think about the same way you would if you were a clerk at a hotel. Um, where you're trying to figure out you know, how to make check-in easier and did you get the room you want. I, I think we need to actually do a lot better job training people, not just to be managers, but actually to be customer service mm -hmm. managers, to see themselves as really working for their constituents and then figure out how government can be easier, more transparent, easier to access, easier to use, and bring service to people, not wait for them to work through some bureaucratic maze to find us. So 
a lot of those are, are really flipping the way agencies run and operate mm -hmm. and probably doing a lot of cross-training with private sector service individuals who, who know a lot more about that than government officials do. So, so much of the innovation that we see happening in government is happening at state and local levels. You bet. Not at the federal level. You bet. So what is it about the state and local government environment that both fosters uh, and allows that kind of innovation, crea creativity in reimagining how government can work? Well, I think, first of all, I, I am a believer that states are the incubators of innovation. You can try things at the state level. And frankly, nothing happens in Congress. I mean, period. <laughs> also, nothing happens in Congress even when it finally happens, unless about a third of the states have already done it. I mean, there is no brand new idea that starts in Washington uh, and gets implemented in Washington. It really is a collection of ideas that have already been tried and tested by one, two, three, ten states, and then comes to DC as sort of a proven model. Um, and so I think that you can be more nimble at the state level. You And states have, most of us work under the same rules, a mandatory balanced budget. You don't have, I mean, I ran one of the largest domestic part, departments at the federal level, uh, Department of Health and Human Services. I was there for five and a half years. For four of those years, we did not have a budget. No budget. I couldn't have told you from day to day what fiscal year we were in because the rules are so Byzantine and peculiar. I, I mean, we, we had money. The government got shut down three times mm -hmm. when I was there, shut down. Um, and you know, in our department, that meant people may or may not have had their Medicare benefits paid on time. They may not have gotten their qualifications for a health insurance. I mean, we were talking, uh, folks, twice during my brief tenure there had to be told that the clinical trials they had qualified for at the National Institutes of Health were going to be put on hold for a period of time we never knew how long. I mean, luckily it was relatively short, but we're talking about life or death mm -hmm. decisions that politicians were sort of fooling around with because they wanted to make some symbolic gesture. You, you could not do that at the state level. I don't think any state would tolerate that. Um, and the rules don't allow it. So there's a functionality about state and local government and an ability to, you know, constituents can literally go knock on somebody's door or go find them or go, um, you know, protest in the Capitol until the teachers get a raise or, um, that's very hard to do in Washington. Mm -hmm. So there's also a level of engagement that is much more personal. Mm -hmm. and, and immediate responsiveness. You bet. Well, sometimes know. not immediate, but <laughs> eventual responsiveness. <laughs> eventual. Take that. Um, so let's circle back a little bit uh, in your career. You mentioned that uh, you spent some time in the Kansas Department of Corrections. I did. And then you ran an association for a while. I did. What decided, or what led you to make the decision to actually run for elected office? Um, it's, it's interesting uh, because I think a lot of people assume, looking at my biography and my family history, that I always was going to run for office. I always was going to do that. Um, that isn't the case. I love politics. I, I found Democrats here when I first came to Kansas because I didn't know anybody else and that was sort of the tribe I was looking for. Um, so I got involved in other people's campaigns, but I never saw myself as the one running for office. Um, what changed my mind is I was married to, um, and still am, um, <laughs> to a busy trial lawyer. Our children were two years old and five years old. I had a job that was requiring um, not only long work hours, but a lot of travel. And when my local legislator, who lived a block away, decided that she was not going to run again, she came to me and said, why don't you run? And actually, I ran to go home. 
um, <laughs> not to go someplace else. Because in Kansas, the legislature is a part-time legislature. We lived in the capital city. It was a job that was going to be very into, and I knew the job because I'd you know, been lobbying in the legislature and I'd done volunteer work in the legislature. I knew the policy side of it, but it was very intense January through April, and then um, they went home. And uh, summers were off, basically. You could pick and choose political committees. So for me, it was a much more conducive lifestyle to being a working mom than the job I was in. And so it, um, I made the pivot to run, and, and the eight years I served, my kids basically got um, pretty close to uh, high school, and then the insurance commissioner job was a block uh, away from the Capitol and also allowed me to do a statewide job but stay at home at a time that, that was pretty important to me. Talk a little bit about bringing that working mom perspective to the state legislature. <laughs> um, well, actually, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's both helpful and troubling um, that some of the discussion that I hear in Congress, some of the discussion around the recent Supreme Court hearing, some, uh, you could close your eyes and it could be the early 70s uh, all over again. I mean, it's, it's really sort of shocking that some of those conversations are still going on um, and that, you know, the challenge we are, it, it makes me really unhappy that we're still in America, one of the developed the only developed country in the world without paid parental leave, that we're the only developed country in the world without um, really some kind of guaranteed early childhood support and help for working parents. Um, my son and daughter-in-law, both of whom work, have a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a, a baby on the way, and luckily they have um, workplaces that are supportive. They've got resources, they've got grandparents, but most people don't have that. Um, so when I was, uh, my children were born in 1981 and 1984, my OBGYN recommended this very uh, novel notion that I would take the babies to work, which I did for six months. And it worked beautifully. People thought I had lost my mind, but um, it really did work. It was, and so when I became insurance commissioner, we instituted that policy throughout the department. And when I became governor, we allowed other agencies to do that. And mothers or fathers could actually bring their babies with them to a work site that was conducive. I mean, if you worked on the highway and you were putting asphalt down, that was not <laughs> terribly good. But you know, in most office situations, it actually worked. So things like that you could do, because, mm -hmm. and I knew that you could do it because I had done it. So as an employer and then um, in a you know, public space, because I, I had been a working mom and because I had to juggle that, um, I could figure that out. I also brought bills forward on early childhood education and childcare. Um, I always find it very interesting that childcare is regarded as a woman's issue. Um, I used to say, you know, my husband can't go to work if our children aren't being taken care of either. So, um, but we haven't made a lot of progress mm -hmm. on that. And I, I continue to hope that more women leaders may, may help break mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you have seen, but the young Australian or New Zealand, New Zealand. prime minister right. who's got her baby, I mean, she's making a very clear statement every day that this is something women need to do. They, you know, they balance mm -hmm. childbearing and leadership, and we just need to make more progress in this country, yeah. I think. Yeah. It continues to be a challenge. Um, so you were in the state legislature, and you decided to run for the Kansas Insurance Commissioner. Any kind of background in being a Kansas Insurance Commissioner? It was the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> um, no, I had no background. And I had, I had absolutely, the most terrifying thing was I had absolutely no idea what went on in the office, um, literally. So the Kansas Insurance Commissioner um, had always been a Republican. No Democrat had ever held that office in the history of the state. Let's start there. And then um, when I ran, I ran against an incumbent but um, between 
the incumbent I ran against and his two predecessors, they had, they had served 50 years in the office, those three men. And um, I literally, I, I didn't know anybody who worked there. I didn't know, I figured since it said Kansas Insurance Department, and I had worked on insurance, health insurance issues in the legislature, I'd been on the insurance committee, um, that it must have something to do with that, but I literally didn't really know. <laughs> and I kept thinking, so I, I kind of came at this from as an outsider, saying, you know, I'm not gonna take any money from anybody who, who we regulate. I knew that they regulated companies, and, um, at, and frankly, that was a pretty safe bet because I'm running against the incumbent. Anybody would have to be insane if you worked in the insurance business to write a check to me because the incumbent would know about it in a heartbeat. So I figured turning down that money wasn't terribly hard because no one was gonna give me any money anyway. <laughs> um, but I, uh, you know, it was, um, I kept thinking I needed some credentials for the campaign trail, something to be able to say other than I'm interested and you know, I'll learn about it when I get there. Um, so I, I looked around and I decided to take the the, the test to be an insurance agent, because that was at least a, a qualification that I could say, I've got the qualifications. And it turns out that the test was a computer test, and I, you know, I looked at the materials and I thought, I can do this, so I studied, um, and then went and took the test, and at the, um, at the bottom of the test, now this was not a requirement to ha hold this office. I just figured it was something I could talk about on the campaign trail. At the bottom of the screen, it said, the results of this test will be sent to you and to the Kansas Insurance Department. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, well maybe this is gonna be the shortest campaign on the face of the earth because I knew that if I had flunked the test, it would not last very long. Um, <laughs> and I figured it would be a sign from God. And if she was listening, she'd have me pass. And if not, so I hit send, and indeed I passed. Um, and it turned out it was, it was a great experiment in, in public administration because this was a department um, that was literally stuck in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And um, so first, I had to learn what people did very quickly. I had to find some people who might have some skills that I could bring with me. I, um, and then we had to figure out ways that we really updated the office. So the office used to close from 12 to one, literally close. Wouldn't answer the phones, locked all the doors. And if you think about customer service, mm -hmm. if you've had a wreck over the weekend, if you're trying to access your health insurance benefits, if you, you might try to call for some help on your lunch hour. Not a chance, not a chance that anybody's gonna answer the phone. So things like that mm -hmm. we could change fairly quickly. Um, this was 1994 and nobody used a computer, nobody had a desktop computer. There was one mainframe computer and one troll who sat on the third floor who programmed the computer and, and literally when they went on vacation it just stopped. You stopped and it didn't matter if you wanted to know how many life insurance agents there were in Lenexa, Kansas or what security benefits solvency was. You know, it. It was all on the one mainframe computer. So some things like that were, were relatively easy to update and say to people, we have to actually, we work for them, they don't work for us. Um, and then learn this whole um, how, what a regulatory agency should do, uh, you know, balance um, consumer interests with solvency, how you then got people to do that, how we, I mean, we rewrote every, piece of material, we rehired people, we retrained people, and um, it was a great exercise in what you do in an agency to sort of, you know, think about what the mission needed to be, where we were, how you then worked toward that mission, and how you brought people along, and um, it, was, it was a great experience. It was the most terrifying four months of my life were when I won. 
and then thought, what in the world am I going to do? But it worked. So being on the inside of an agency and really having to learn the programs from the bottom up and manage that kind of work, how did that shape your political agenda, your goals for the future? Well, it was interesting. Um, again, it was an office that I, I thought could be a consumer office, and it turned out it was a very important consumer office um, because you can't buy a car, buy a house, access the healthcare system, take care of your family without an insurance product. So everybody needed something, and most people had no idea um, how to navigate the system or what their choices were. So we tried to be the most consumer-facing um, office we could possibly be. And healthcare began to be more and more a uh, focus, um, fighting with insurance companies to get benefits paid. We ran the high-risk pool because the laws allowed insurance companies to pick and choose who got insurance and not. And so we ran that. I mean, so I learned those pieces of the puzzle from kind of the ground up. And it turned out that was probably the best expertise that I took to HHS with the passage of a major health law because I knew um, insurance is regulated at the state level. It is not regulated at the federal mm -hmm. level, but nobody at the federal government had done that before. So that became an enormously important um, criteria for you know figuring out what we were doing. But I'd say the you know the notion that you you have to figure out and again I go back to the public administration framework of what is the challenge, you know, what are the the possibilities for solving the challenge, what kind of talent do you need to move in one direction, and then how do you mobilize the assets to do that? All of that, um, I think, was sort of fundamentally part of that framework that I got very early on and just could apply it over and over again, even in areas that I really didn't know what I was doing. And that, that was certainly one of them. It's good to know that, that you had a strong foundation to tackle some of those kinds of really challenging organizational issues. How did that shape your decision to run for governor? Um, well, we had a major fight in the state about Blue Cross Blue Shield and whether or not an outside company was going to take over the Kansas company or not. Um, and it was the decision, the way the law works, was pretty far down the road toward the takeover plan, I, I was, the law gave the insurance commissioner an opportunity to say yes or no, but it was really always seen as a, mm -hmm. you know, check the box kind of thing. And nobody expected any um, decision differently. I felt very strongly that this was not good for Kansas consumers. It wasn't going to be good for um, payers and providers in this, in this state that it, you know, we would be very disadvantaged by having um, an insurance plan that wasn't owned and operated by Kansan. So that mobilizing um, that discussion and participating across the state in um, educating people about what the choices were uh, in, in part was uh, part of my decision making that um, I was, we knew that the incumbent governor was at the end of his second term. It was going to be an open seat. And um, I felt pretty sure. I mean, that job I actually knew something about, um, <laughs> being governor. My dad had been a governor. I'd worked around the office. Um, so that was a lot less mysterious to me, um, what they actually did. And um, it, it, it felt like, uh, I mean, I, I thought I had done um, what I could do in the office I was in, and then, you know, that was a, a very exciting possibility of a next step. And since I'd run statewide twice and been successful, that also seemed like it was it was a feasible um, run. But the the Blue Cross Blue Shield fight sort of was the was the um, maybe the prelude to doing that. What having that discussion with Kansans from Western Kansas all the way east, and then ultimately making a decision was, was pretty important. And when you were governor, you were really known for your bipartisan relationships. 
um, you're bringing both sides to the table in your approach for governing. Do you think we're seeing a resurgence of bipartisanship in Kansas? Is you see, uh... yes, I mean, to, to a degree. So, um, I mean, I had a Republican legislature the whole time I was governor. So you had to have a bipartisan approach or I could sit in my office with, you know, a limited number of Democrats and we could have had a lovely time, but nothing would have happened. Um, so you had to figure out how to get 63 votes in the House and 21 votes in the Senate. And that coalition was a little bit different depending on what the issue was, but it, it basically was, you know, a group of more moderate Republicans and most, if not all, of the Democrats. And that could put together the coalition around school funding or the Bioscience Authority or, you know, a road plan. Um, what we saw then with my um, successor after uh, my lieutenant governor um, had the job for about a year and a half and then, and then the Republican governor was elected um, was a real shift, I think, to, it was a um, unilateral government where the Republicans had the governor's office and the state senate and the state house. And the governor did um, what I have never seen any elected official do uh, is um, because he was unsuccessful passing what he felt to be a, a very important tax cut for Kansas, he actually recruited um, more conservative candidates, uh, ran and supported them against members of his own party, campaigned uh, for the conservative candidates, beat the members of his own party, and then succeeded to put and implement policies. So you, you saw a real shift in the legislature. The kind of coalition that was there when I was governor was actually kind of blown apart. Um, and in 2016, I would say Kansas voters went back to that more um, moderate uh, coalition of legislators uh, in in the state, so they were able to to do some different kinds of things. But it was really the legislature that began to make a pivot back. So, what do you think the biggest challenges are for governors today? Thinking maybe about how the federal government is or is not implementing um, state assistance programs, or the challenges rising up from the city level. Well, I think, it's, I, I think it's very, very difficult at the state or local level to know what the rules are at the federal level. Um, uh, you know, certainty um, in what is going to be funded and what's not going to be funded. Certainty in what the, what the rules are around climate change or involving auto emissions or um, what kind of money is going to come through the education department? What, what health and human services is going to stand for? Does the federal law stay or go? So I think, I think that the, the uncertainty about what Congress is likely to do, what this administration is likely to do, and how then to plan adequately to uh, either um, deal in that framework or defend against that framework is very, very tough because it changes moment by mm -hmm. moment. So I would say that's a different situation than I've ever seen. Again, uh, George Bush was president the entire time I was governor, so it isn't as if I had a Democratic president to work with as a Democratic governor. But we, we kind of knew what the rules were and, and the law was pretty clear and what we would be funded what kind of money would come to the state was clear. And when there was a crisis, which there was um, in as the 2008-9 recession started, there was really a very bipartisan effort to make sure as much as possible that states were able to be solvent. So um, Medicaid, uh, dollars were increased at every state so people would not lose their health insurance, at least the lowest income workers wouldn't lose their health insurance. More money was sent to schools to try anything that could be done through government mm -hmm. to try and stabilize the economy, at least at the state level, was done. 
I don't think any governor could count on that happening today. Yeah. Um, so that puts a governor or a mayor in a very tricky situation, trying to figure out what, what the rules of the road are and then what you can do. And you watch now governors, so the California governor <clears throat> has been the you know, front and center, but New York is doing this, some other states, where as the federal government pulls out of an area, the states then say, well, if you're not, you know, if you're not gonna be part of the Paris Accord, then we as a, a, a state will actually do, you know, keep the standards uh, for climate change, or we're going to move in a different direction on immigration, or we're going to um, combat your uh, policies in this area. Again, I'm, I'm not sure our governmental framework was meant to, that's a, that's a lot of tension inside of a framework that's, a, that's designed as a federalist framework um, where the, the federal government typically sets the floor and provides resources and sets the global policy and then states often can move up or down mm -hmm. within that. We, we've sort of flipped that at right. this point, and I, I think it's a much trickier area to govern. How do we prepare folks for those kinds of responsibilities? Well, I, I, I think, again, encouraging the, the brightest, most innovative, most um, thoughtful individuals to um, run for office is important. Um, because I think people have to be more creative than they've ever been in the past. Uh, I'm, I worry about the impact of social media, um, not just on what it does with 24-7 news and everybody creating their own world of reality and no agreement on facts, that's very difficult, but also on the implications around what it does with our election process. And I don't think we are prepared at the city, the state, the federal level for cybersecurity threats and for voter security threats. I worry a lot in this state about the next three weeks, um, about our election process, about voters being disqualified, about you know people actually being able to access the ballot box and make their voices heard and make, you know, weigh in on this democracy. And I think once those fundamental issues begin to be questioned, if people really aren't certain that there's a legitimacy around their elected officials or the election process, or they feel that they've been so gerrymandered out of having a voice and a vote, that's, that's when there becomes, I think, a shaky basis for the whole democracy. And, and we're not there. I think we have a resilient constitution. We have some brilliant founders who really wrote it to guard against despots and kings and put in checks and balances. But if people don't exercise those checks and balances who have those important roles, if we don't really have a a system that functions the way the system was designed to do, um, we're in some pretty precarious territory. Yeah. Well, let's switch tactics again here. I wanna take the next step in your career. So you're a sitting governor, and one day you get a call from the president. Mm -hmm. uh, what went through your mind when uh, President Obama asked you to come to Washington and be the Secretary of Health and Human Service? Well, it, it didn't occur out of the blue. Um, so I met Barack Obama when he was running for the Senate in 2004. And um, I had friends in Chicago who said, you need to see this guy. I mean, there's something going on here. And he was in this really crazy race. I think there were seven Democrats. There were three self-funding multimillionaires. There were two sitting statewide office holders. There were just all kinds of people who and you know he was, as he likes to describe himself, a, a skinny black legislator whose name was Barack Hussein Obama and who had giant ears. And you know nobody <laughs> thought he would be doing much of anything. But there was something clearly happening. He was traveling around the state in these town hall meetings. Anyway, I met him. We quickly established a Kansas connection. Uh, his mother and his grandmother are Kansans. And um, he said to me early on, if, um, 
I really don't like our governor very much. He was right, he went to prison later, but, um, <laughs> you know. Um, so why don't you be my governor? Because I, I sort of have these Kansas ties. And I said, well, I don't really like our senators very much, so maybe when you get elected, you can be my senator. <laughs> so we, had, we adopted each other. And um, so I knew him from that point on when he was talking about running. Um, he, he, basically called and said, if I run, will you help me? Um, and I said, yes. And my son, I have two boys. The older one is a very policy wonky kid who loved Obama's policies and thought he was brilliant and blah, 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 and you know, was all in. The younger one said, Mom, he needs old white women. You need to get, and he did. He was running against Hillary Clinton, and he needed old white women to say, this is OK in the primary. Um, and John said, you've got to get out there. Um, so they were encouraging <laughs> endorsement. For, and John also said, you know, and anybody who can get Michelle Obama to marry him is got to be really good. <laughs> he came at it sort of from a different angle. Um, but they were both right. Uh, so I, I was one of the few women office holders who did not endorse Hillary Clinton, but endorsed Barack Obama, and um, had campaigned for him um, all over the country, and you know was vetted for a variety of things. So he actually didn't ask me to do this job initially. He um, asked me after the election if I would come and be a cabinet secretary. And the two things I was kind of interested in, and I told him this from the outset, were energy, because I thought that was about the future, and health. Those were the two areas. And not that the rest weren't really important, but I did not see that my passion and expertise and whatever were in those areas. And, he wanted a nuclear scientist in energy, which was absolutely right, and that clearly was not me. Um, I could spell it, but I could not. <laughs> um, so, and he asked Tom Daschle to be his HHS secretary. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was second choice. Um, and so I told him I didn't want to be considered for a cabinet that I, I um, serve out my term. He needed people on the ground. I could be helpful, and then maybe after 2010, if people, you know, we could, we could talk about it again. So I actually turned him down when, right after the election. Um, and so when Tom Daschle ended up pulling out, um, I had a very amusing phone call with the then president of the United States who said, all right, I'm not offering you this job, but if I offered you, you this job, would you take this job? I said, yes. So we then began the process. He was kind of mad at me at that point. <laughs> it's a tough but way to so start. Much. Not so much. so um, we have to talk about the Affordable Care Act when we talk about your tenure in health and human services. But I don't want to do it from a political perspective. I want to talk about it from uh, a public administration perspective. So some people will say that the initial failure of the rollout of the registration site was really a failure of the federal human capital system, that we had lost the capacity in our federal civil service to manage a program of that scale and of that complexity. And we had missed out at the federal level on customer service, and that that was also a big part of the failure. Do you think that's the right lesson to take? Is that the lesson that you take? Um, as you might imagine, I still have PTSD from the <laughs> early days, so I'm probably not the most accurate judge. It actually, I would say, uh, some of those issues we did very well. Um, what was not, what it is a lesson is how badly a technology project was managed. Um, and that I think is, is um, was significant because this was going to be um, easier than, you know, signing up on kayak for a trip um, to use the website, and that was what uh, kind of was a glitch. And there are all kinds of reasons for that, not the least of which the government is required to, some of this has changed, thank God, but the government's required to use um, already 
qualified suppliers, mm -hmm. which always will put you two generations behind in technology. I mean, what you don't want is somebody who did a good project 20 years ago. You want somebody who can do a good project, you know, next week, next month, who's sitting in a basement in a Batman suit, you know, <laughs> coding something. Those folks don't tend to be on the federal supplier list. Um, once something's broken, you can bring them in, and we did find them and bring them in, but you can't bring them in at the outset. Um, so that was a problem, and, and we had eight weeks of website hell. What, what I've learned, though, Terry, is as much as people would like to ascribe that that's a government failure, I have not talked to a single CEO who put a big technology project in place that wasn't over budget and off time. Most of them don't do it, though, with 24-7 cameras running and you know, reporting to the President of the United States. They do it, and they can beta test things. We could not beta test anything. We could not roll out a website and say, OK, people in Lawrence, Kansas, for two months can try the website and enroll in health insurance and get your benefits rolling. And just don't tell anybody else. You know, we're just gonna. But that's the way a product would be done in the private sector. You test it and you see what. None of that could happen. Um, but, you know, having said that, so the website failed on October first, which was supposed to be opening day of enrollment. Was fixed by December first. Benefits didn't start until January 1st, so nobody lost benefits. We had a million people enrolled by January 1st, and by the close of the first open enrollment, there were 8 million people who had made it through the website. And, and you know, call centers worked the whole time, navigators on the ground worked the whole time. So in terms of customer service, we actually could do a pretty good job. We just couldn't get people through the website until, until it got fixed. Um, but I think folks who say, well, you know, that's clear, government can't run anything, um, just are, are wrong about this. There are, um, you know, millions of people now. This attempt to sell insurance this way had never been done. And folks say, well, you know, Amazon can sell you a purple sweater and you can be anywhere and you can just go on and qualify. What Amazon doesn't do is sell you a purple sweater that is ordered in your size that has with it how many children you have in your family and you're paying a different price in Kansas than you are in Montana and you're buying it from a different company um, and the fact that that all had to be figured out um, along the way uh, made it a much more complicated process but insurance will never be sold the same way again mm -hmm. I mean it sort of blew apart the, the old model and people finally can see what they're buying. They can compare prices. They can qualify for benefits, uh, you know, seamlessly. They can go online. So I'll take 20 million people with health insurance versus a lousy eight weeks of website anytime. You know, I think it's a pretty good trade. And I can always make technology people feel better when I talk to them because I say, okay. Who's ever had a problem? They're like, uh, you know, and who's ever done this? Uh, I say, well, get over it. Nothing could ever be this bad. So, <laughs> whatever you've been through, it's nothing. <laughs> well, so you had, as we sort of laid it out here, a really broad and interesting career. You've been a policymaker and a policy implementer. You've been a career civil servant, an elected official, an appointed official. When you think about all of those different roles that you've played in government, would you say that one is more influential or more important than the other? Um, how would you compare mm -hmm. them? And what would you tell people who are thinking about a career in public service today about where to start? I'd say, uh, let me start at the end of that, because I, I think anybody who's thinking about a career in public service, I would say go for it. Um, it is, uh, and it really doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter if it's a you know, school board, uh, being the mayor of your town, working in an agency, you know, running a park, 
being in state government. And by the way, hopefully we'll need a lot of talent in state government, so if there are people out here thinking about new starts. Um, but I, I do think it is a way, it, it is um, an enormous opportunity for somebody to make a difference in, in the community in which they live, uh, on issues that they care about, you know, influence their future, their kids' future. So I, I'm a big uh, fan of the public sector side of the house. Um, not that you can't, you know, do great things in the private sector, but I think too often they're overlooked. And I would say for me, at least, um, each step was, I loved each step. I, I really loved being in the House of Representatives. Um, it, it was a great learning experience about policy, how to get things done. I mean, that's really where I learned about bipartisanship because I, I was a Democratic member, always in the minority, except for two years of that experience. So I always had to go find partners on the Republican side and usually put their names first on the bill, and then they, it would get a hearing in committee. Um, but you learn some of those, or how to put people together, or how to count votes. Um, that really um, served, I mean, as insurance commissioner, I could bring good people in, but then I, you know, learning a whole area and drilling down on what a regulatory agency was like, and then how you influence consumers. That helped enormously when I became governor, and there's no better training to be a cabinet secretary than be a governor. And we could watch that. I mean, I, I served on a cabinet where about a third of us had been governors. And it just made that job um, much easier because the rhythm is the same. You get the most talented people you possibly can. I mean, in my case, they were running 11 big agencies, the Food and Drug Administration, the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, Children and Families, Mental Health Services, Drug Abuse Issues. Um, but we did that at the state level, found really talented cabinet people who then knew their stuff, you know, figured out what the mission was and, and helped give them the support services. So, each job kind of built on the next job, and each one of them I, I, I loved when I was there. I feel very honored to have had that journey. And um, I think each learning experience, I mean, what I, what I like to tell a lot of younger people who are thinking about this or in their first job is, you know, make a great Rolodex of everybody you think is, is smart, who you're calling on and who's mentoring you, because you're gonna find 10 years down the road you wanna reach back to those folks. Keep an eye on other things that are going on. Learn as much as you can. I wish we did more cross-training in agencies across government, um, because it would give, I think, officials and, and the administrators in those agencies a much better eye, because um, customers, consumers, Americans don't get up in the morning and think, oh, I need this agency for that and this agency for, I mean, they just want somebody who helps them, helps navigate their lives, helps figure out what it is that they can access, what can make a difference, what can make things easier, and I think we in government are much too siloed mm -hmm. and having people who really spend some time in a different agency, who know a much broader perspective, who, who um, you know, can, can really serve their customers in a very different way and in a multifaceted way, that would be something that we should do in the future that we don't do very well now. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to stop with the quiz questions, <laughs> and we're going to switch to audience quiz questions. So, um, Rosemary, do you have those? Okay. <laughs> I already have one from the audience. What can be done to restore a fact-based political dialogue so policymakers are held accountable again and the concept of public service regains the credibility and value it deserves? Um, it's a great question, and um, I don't think it happens 
uh, until the majority of people insist that it happens. And I'm a big believer in citizen power uh, in this field. And I know we are, you know, getting more and more tribal, but um, science is science. And um, I had the experience um, where uh, when we had a, a very dangerous flu outbreak at the beginning of, of my tenure as HHS secretary, um, we had sort of the anti-vaccination crowd coming to the table and and suggesting in various forms of public media that um, if you got uh, this vaccination against the flu, it could cause all sorts of effects. None of it science-based, none of it backed up by any information. And, and it really took calling on the press saying, you are, you are actually putting people at risk. You are potentially killing people by allowing Jenny McCarthy and Dr. Ann Shukat to be side by side as if it's a point counterpoint, because Dr. Ann Shukat is an epidemiologist from CDC and is going to be based entirely in science, entirely in fact. And Jenny McCarthy has no scientific fact behind what she's saying, but presenting this as a let's make a choice is very dangerous. So I, I, I really do believe when that ha I mean, we, we just have to call people out. And, and we as citizens have to insist that it really isn't um, either or. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the former senator from the state of New York, used to say, you know, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. And I, I we really have to um, and it can't just be in a political debate. It's got to be citizens saying, no, I mean, that's just not wrong. I mean, it's, it's absolutely wrong. You can't print that calling on the news media to call it out is wrong, announcing it is wrong, and, and going back to a fact-based, historic-based uh, system. Because until we do that, then anything goes, um, which is a dangerous place to be, really dangerous. Thank you. Um, who are your influences and why? Wow. Um, you know, growing up, I, I would say the uh, one, uh, certainly my parents, uh, some teachers, but I, I had the experience of going to an all-girls school. And it turns out that was an important building block for me at that time because in my life, from a very young age, girls did everything. You could be the president of the class, you were the you know, treasurer of the class, you were the athletes and the ballerinas, we had the smartest in the class and the dumbest in the class. Um, I mean, it never occurred to me that girls could do some things and boys had to do the other things. And that, that was a very fundamental um, lesson. So the nuns turned out to be great accidental feminists. Um, <laughs> you know, they were pretty ferocious about it, too. Um, so they were great influencers. I've had really good mentors. I had a, a wonderful um, a woman who taught me to write grants early on. I had, in the criminal justice system, I had, um, I mean, I had a guy who was the Secretary of Corrections who I would say in no way, shape, or form was either a feminist or anybody who came from a background that I knew anything about. Um, but he knew it was wrong that we didn't have, I was the only woman who wasn't a, a secretary in the office who was in the central office in the Department of Corrections. Um, and there were a lot of guys there who really did not want me there and thought this was a terrible thing. Who literally, I was in an office for three years. Five of the main policy people in the office never spoke to me. Never spoke to me. Um, I would say to them every morning, good morning, how are you? The best revenge is um, payback. Um, one of them applied for a job later for me. And I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't hear you. I don't, I don't know what you're saying. But um, so there were people, men and women, who I think uh, helped along the way to just say, you can do this and go ahead, you know, um, 
we'll teach you how to do it, we'll help you to do it. And, and I've been very fortunate to have those folks at various points in my life. Great. Our next question is, how can the average citizen make the most impact? Get involved. Um, I mean, I know it's very trite to say, but certainly voting, um, because somebody's gonna make those decisions, and not voting, I think, is, is really giving up on, on, it's just giving over a whole set of decisions to somebody else, and you may not like what they do. Um, but I also, I, I'm a big believer that do something, do something uh, to make a difference. And, and it certainly doesn't have to be running for office, but it, it should be taking on some kind of challenge that's outside your, your individual work, your individual family. It could be charity work, it could be um, you know, public policy of some kind, it could be getting a crosswalk in your neighborhood. Uh, but engaging, I, I do think in a democracy, we're called on <clears throat> to be active participants. It's not a spectator sport. Um, it's supposed to be active engagement. So I, I am a big believer that everybody needs to pick something, um, you know, it, it may be your kid's school project, but some place where you can actually help move the needle forward, help make some progress. Um, and I think if all of us did that uh, in individual ways, it, it just makes a huge difference. Um, and certainly anything we can do with the younger generation and the younger generation than that and the very youngest generation um, to uh, help them be as open, inclusive, curious, engaged as possible, I think we will have a lot better future. We have two more. Is there an increased problem that people are going into government for the wrong reasons? For example, for their own gain in the future or not the public interest? You know, I, I would say uh, there are two levels of that. There certainly are people running for office now, but I'm not sure more than in the past, who, um, you know, my dad always used to say, and I know this is said lots of different ways, but he always used to say, there are people who run for office to be somebody, and there are people who run for office to do something. And that's, I think, been the case for a long time. The people who run for office to be somebody can be pretty dangerous. And, um, but they've been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, there have been public servants, public servants, um, for years who uh, are economic miracles. You know, their salary level is $45,000, $50,000 a year, and they end up as multimillionaires. Um, who knew? But, um, so I mean, there always have been people who find ways, unfortunately, to use government and influence as a way to enrich themselves or their families or make deals. I'm not sure that has changed dramatically, although I have never seen a group quite like the group in DC, and you can watch it very transparently, where there doesn't seem to be any set of rules that applies, any set of ethical considerations. On the other hand, I, I don't think that, I mean, what I find to be curious is that same mixed group are the ones who are loudest and most derogatory toward the working uh, public servants, who I have always found, um, uh, not that they're universally brilliant and, uh, necessarily all share the same views, but by and large are people who really are doing the jobs that they do at under market value uh, because they, they believe in, in whatever it is that they're doing and they have a certain goal and a mission. And um, I mean, the people I've had the privilege to work with in um, the state government, uh, in the federal government, uh, were extraordinary. And so I, I think that the elected politicians are, are a much more mixed bag often than the 
um, civil servants who often are, I think, um, as a group, a much more um, inspirational group of, of workers and folks. And, and thank God they're there because they keep, they keep progress moving. Thank you. Our last question, and we have to ask, <laughs> uh, would you consider running for office again? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a please on the card. So. <laughs> Here's the deal. I, I really do believe that um, uh, I've had a great run. I, you know, eight times on the ballot is enough. Um, five and a half years in, in a high-level cabinet position was plenty. Um, and I'm delighted to help people, to recruit people, to mentor people, to you know, raise money for folks, campaign for them. But I want the next generation. We should never, in my humble opinion, we should never have a 70-year-old again as president of the United States, ever, 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 either party. Half the world is under 25. Um, I, I think America needs younger leaders across the board, Republicans and Democrats. I, I am troubled by people who um, can't take a graceful bow and move aside and, and encourage the pipeline. So I, no, I, <laughs> I won't be running, but I'll be, um, you know, helping a lot of other people run and be in office and applauding them and helping in any way I can, but not me. <laughs> well, so let me just wrap up then with one last question. What are you most optimistic about in the field of public service? Well, I am optimistic that um, I think we have a generation of um, public-minded, younger people who see themselves as global citizens and are eager to figure out ways that they can be involved and engaged. And um, I'm hoping, and you see them running for office, um, we saw them coming into offices, into situations, and I think that's very encouraging about the future. Um, when you know folks want to know what it is that they'll be doing uh, and what kind of difference it makes. And the third thing they want to talk about then is how much money they make, as opposed to the flip side. Uh, that I find to be a very encouraging trend. Um, and I, I think that we're seeing this very diverse and um, community-minded, public service-minded uh, group of folks who, who are saying, you know, if you're not figuring out things that are going to make a positive difference in the future, then get out of the way, because we'll help to figure that out. And I think that's exactly the right message, and, and I'm very enthusiastic about it. So I hope the KU School of Public Administration is full of those folks who are ready to roll. Wow. Governor, I want to thank you for your time. Terry Girton, Kathleen Sebelius, you are both rock stars and goddesses. We are so thrilled and honored that you have been here this evening with us. Thank you so much. We've learned so much from you and we're so inspired by you. We have small gifts for you from the School of Public Affairs and Administration. You get a spa pen and a 70th anniversary sticky Jayhawk for your lapels. <laughs> And um, from Lawrence Public Library, yeah, we're not done yet. Um, uh, we have a special tradition at the library that we give gold library cards to our special guests. So there is Terry's, just to kind of get you uh, for what that looks like. And actually, Kathleen, 
Yours actually works. There's a barcode on the back. <laughs> we have set up an account for you so you can come to the library and check out all sorts of stuff. There's instructions inside. And, um, but we will not pay your fines, so. <laughs> I, we draw the line there, but thank you so much. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much for coming out, and we will see you again. Come to the library.